Mr. Wim Gertz, welcome to Kosovo. What brings you here? Well, as a human rights ambassador for the Netherlands, I uh, pay working visits to countries to discuss human rights issues and see how we can cooperate and uh, also get a good sense of what's going on in the country. And uh, that's why I just spent two days in Belgrade and now two days here in uh, Pristina. So, as you look at our country among the entire world, because you're monitoring human rights for your government, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, all over the world. How does Kosovo look in terms of human rights violations? Uh, mm -hmm. What does a big picture about Kosovo look like in terms of human rights? Well, first of all, you know, there's no country in the world has a perfect uh, track record when it comes to human rights. Also the Netherlands, we have our own challenges as well. When I look at Kosovo, I think also since Kosovo's independence, uh, a lot of progress has been made. Uh, I do think, you know, uh, if you look at the challenges that, that we are seeing, it has to do with issues like media freedom, for example, uh, LGBTIQ plus rights, women's rights, um, and you know, overall also the position of minorities, making sure that uh, people can all uh, have their, their rights respected. And uh, I think that Kosovo is, is working hard on these issues and, and we want to engage in a, in a discussion to see also where we can help. Also because, of course, Kosovo is in Europe and is on its way to become um, a member of the European Union and to become a member of the Council of Europe. And we want to see where we can help uh, on the path towards those memberships. Um, you spoke about media freedom as one of the first issues. In Kosovo, there is a feeling that, uh, not just in Kosovo, but uh, Kosovo has been uh, scoring high on improvement on media freedom in international reports. Is that true from your perspective? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, we, we follow also the Reporters Without Borders. They have a media freedom index. And you see also last year that Kosovo again uh, went up a number of places in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. So that's very good. Uh, and I think it's very good you know, for a, a vibrant democracy mm -hmm. to have media pluralism, to hear different voices. Um, I was our ambassador to China before I started this job. Mm -hmm. And in China, there is no uh, media plurality. And you see what that does to a society. So I'm very pleased to see that in, in Kosovo, uh, we see real media pluralism, and that's a very healthy thing. It's good for people to be able to have access to different voices and then on the basis of that form their own opinion. And since you just came back from Serbia on your trip there, how was this issue in Serbia? If you look at the uh, Reporters Without Borders Media Freedom Index, then Serbia is uh, much lower on that list. So that implies that the challenges there are definitely uh, uh, more serious than uh, where Kosovo is right now. But Kosovo is failing on your second issue you mentioned, the LGBTQ+. Plus. Kosovo is failing on a big test right now, uh, stopping entire civil code because of the possibility of same-sex marriage being allowed by the current code. What does that tell you? Uh, what is that a signal for in countries like Netherlands and Council of Europe, uh, people like yourself that, that monitor Kosovo mm -hmm. from outside? Yeah. For us, LGBTIQ plus rights are very important. Uh, we are very proud that we, we were actually the first country in the world to introduce same-sex marriage uh, at, the, at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, meanwhile, followed by many other countries. So it wasn't that long ago. It was in this. It's fairly century. recent, and if you okay. if you look at a bit of a longer period, you know, I think that the improvement of those rights uh, has made great, yeah, made pr great progress, which is a very positive uh, development from our point of view, because you know we think it's very important that people can be who they are, uh, and I think that also the, from what I understand, you know, Kosovo is also making uh, steps forward and. You have, for example, this uh, bubble cafe here in Pristina. Uh, and those are very positive developments, I think. And you have a, a pride parade. So that's, that, those developments are good. Uh, but I think there's still room for improvement. And uh, the issue you're referring to, uh, 
you know, on, on the, um, but many the people, civil code. Yes, uh, people would say, uh, say, our parliamentarians mm -hmm. who are fighting uh, this particular article are, are saying we are doing it so to, to save our conservative uh, traditional values of the Albanian family. Have you, what would you say to such, uh, let's say, such perspective that, uh, that, that it's conservative values that will have to be applied in Kosovo? Yeah, I find that uh, a, a strange label to use and others use the label family values. Well, you know, people that belong to the LGBTIQ plus community are also part of the family, right? So, but family values, from my point of view, is, is uh, an agenda that's being promoted and rolled out, uh, for example, by, uh, by Russia, to, uh, to try and counter this development and to stimulate, um, you know, those, the traditional values that you refer to. But I think it's... Uh, yeah, more and more countries, fortunately, are, are making steps in the right direction. You see that the number of countries in which uh, you know, same-sex relationships were criminalized, the number is going down every year, which is good, and also discrimination and anti-discrimination legislation around the world is improving every year. So the, the trend is clearly going in one direction. It's very interesting that you mentioned and reminded me that Putin is telling his... Uh, liberal communities that you cannot make us Europeans. The Europeans are bad because they respect LGBTQs. And uh, this is how he is seeing uh, Europe. Uh, it's um, interesting you've done that parallel and that you reminded us of that. How, how has he managed to, uh, to go on with this narrative? I think, you know, from our point of view, we have the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which means that uh, human rights are for everyone, everywhere, at every given time. Uh, and that also, you know, doesn't matter whether uh, a, a man loves another man or, or another woman, or a woman loves another woman or another man. I mean, love is love from our point of view, and that should be respected. And uh, some people, uh, like uh, Putin, are trying to uh, undermine, I think, that trend. Um, but but I'm, I'm very confident that, you know, on a global scale, uh, we are, you know, moving in the only logical way because in the end it's, it's all about human dignity. Mm. Um, I'm thankful that you have noted where Kosovo scores better in than the region, for example, in uh, improving its freedom of speech um, points. However, where we score very badly are women's participation in labor market, women's rights, and a huge rise in violence against women. Mm. Do we, uh, will we figure in whatever you report you do in this respect and in the meetings you have with uh, future officials in Kosovo, you will even meet, I hear, uh, Prime Minister, are you going to raise this issue? Definitely, because we think it's very important. Uh, you know, we believe in, strongly believe in full gender equality, and uh, there is still, as you are referring to, you know, uh, definitely a lot of room for improvement in, in that respect, and that's something that we, you know, we want to engage uh, on and see also how we can help. And, and uh, it's clear, I think, if you look, for example, at, at uh, labor participation. Uh, of women in Kosovo is very low uh, compared also to a country like mine and I really believe also from my own experience uh, you know that that uh, it's important to have this this the equality also in a household and to have you know I think that companies and and organizations function better when they have a healthy gender balance, you know. Uh, In fact, the Kosovo Stability Initiative, uh, which is an organization you, Holland, funds and supports, mm -hmm. has come out with a research report that mm -hmm. has stated that only 14% of women of working age are employed compared to 46% mm -hmm. of women of the working, of men of the working age. Um, what do you think of this discrepancy? Women are not uh, equal anywhere in Europe, but 14% versus 46? That's a, that's a huge gap. And I think that you know, illustrates that a lot of work needs to be done 
um, because it cannot be so that you know that all the work falls on the shoulders of of uh, people depending on their gender, right? Uh, if people want to start a family, that also comes with shared responsibilities and shared tasks, and that cannot, you know, it's very unhealthy. I think, you know, if that falls on the shoulders of of only one of the two parents. So in that sense, I think there's a, yeah, a lot of room uh, for improvement and uh, something that we are definitely interested in in uh, discussing and seeing you know, how to move forward with that. Although, although you may hear excuses that uh, it's a cultural issue, the fact that you have uh, not enough kindergartens, only 10%, 5 to 10% of children uh, of 1 to 5 are in kindergartens, are included in kindergartens in Kosovo, it means that women have nowhere to take their children mm -hmm. uh, and they end up not working for this. Mm -hmm. Can you... Can you ask our government to make more kindergartens? <laughs> Something yeah. that we do every day. Right. We ask our officials, but it makes a big difference if right. you as a human rights officer do that mm. too. I can definitely share our own mm. Dutch experience. And mm. we, what we have learned is when we uh, increased dramatically the number of kindergartens and also subsidized because otherwise it gets too expensive, right? Uh, that really made a big boost uh, and uh, in uh, women's uh, participation in the labor market. So from our own experience, I can only say that it has helped tremendously uh, by doing that because otherwise you know, it be, it's much more difficult for you know, both partners to work full time. Is it possible in Holland for an employer to ask a future employee in an interview whether she has kids already no. or plans to no. make kids? No, that's a question that's not allowed in job interviews in the Netherlands. It's Why? not considered to to be a, a fair question because it, it shouldn't make any difference whether or not that's the case. So that's uh, something that is not a part of our job interview. And do you understand why that question is put here? Do you understand the context of what they mean by that? I understand. Mm. Mm. Um, women are reporting that because they are of birthing age, to spell it out, uh, they, uh, the employer doesn't want to pay for maternity leave what can be a way around this in a country that wants to develop and where economy is important. Um, what would you say to, uh, to employees? Um, I don't know exactly how your legislation is on this point, maternity leave. In the Netherlands, uh, everybody has a right to uh, a fixed period of maternity leave and it doesn't matter where you work you always have a right to, to make use of that and that is protected by the law and, and so no employer can violate that. Mm. Uh, we talked about women but men also are suffering from lack of labor rights because a lot of them are leaving because exploitation. There's new slavery and exploitation in Kosovo that is happening and that's why they want to go to your countries because you have a much better social system. Are you inviting them to do that? <laughs> uh, I think, you know, uh, Kosovo is, is a, a young country, uh, youngest country in Europe. And I think, you know, uh, the country is still developing, which is logical after everything that, that Kosovo has been through. And I think it's also very important for the country to, uh, to develop itself in such a way, also economically, that, you know, you can sustain uh, certain developments into the future. Uh, and then let's say it can be detrimental if you have a so-called brain drain and people leaving the country uh, that are really needed you know, in your own labor market, or not just for now, but also to invest in your, your future. We talked about uh, men, women, LGBT communities, but definitely the most marginalized communities in Kosovo are Roma, Ashkali and Egyptians. Um, mm -hmm. How much are you working on this field and is, how much is your government trying to raise uh, their voice and their issues, mm -hmm. even throughout your visit here? Yeah. Well, also, I mean, the, the position of minorities is also one that we uh, pay attention to and that we, that we try to work on. Uh, and it's uh, different minorities because we, have, we strongly believe in, in uh, you know, equality also in that sense that everybody has the right to the same rights. Finally, Kosovo wants to become member of the Council of Europe. How realistic 
is it that we will be one of the members this year and what would it mean for our human rights record in Kosovo? I think it's re very realistic uh, and we, the Netherlands, are very much in favor of Kosovo joining the Council of Europe. It's a very important organization when it comes to the protection of human rights. I know that also in your uh, constitution you have the direct application of the European Court of Human Rights, which is a very positive thing. I think it will really help Kosovo and, and I'm confident that uh, sooner rather than later uh, Kosovo will be a member of the Council of Europe and we, we look forward to that. People who uh, are watching us uh, would say that our biggest human rights concern, maybe if we do, uh, let's say, uh, from our court monitors, that uh, we, the work we've done for the last 10 years, the biggest concern that came up is the length of trials in Kosovo that goes against any human right. People do not have even a, a remotely fair trial here as an average trial uh, lasts for mm, average of eight years. What would you say to this statistic when you hear it compared to Western Europe, Netherlands, to people who it takes eight years to see an end to your court case and half a million cases are mm -hmm now uh, stuck in our system, uh, mm -hmm. judicial system. Yeah. Now, I think court cases also in our country sometimes can take a very long time. So that in and of itself is not unique. Uh, but if you say that the average is eight years, that is indeed uh, a lot. And um, you know, that I, I would imagine that the government uh, uh, will look into that and see how it can increase the capacity so that, you know, that uh, that period will be reduced and uh, I think that's in everybody's interest because it creates a lot of uncertainty if cases drag on for such a long, long time. Mm. Um, in the end, I just want to thank you publicly for the effort that your government has historically put. Uh, it's your first time here, but your, your government has historically helped for, for about uh, almost two decades, LGBT communities, Roma communities, marginalized ones, and is always supporting the most maybe unpopular issues in Kosovo. Um, you've been very consistent at this, and I thank you for it. You're most welcome, and we, you know, we strongly believe in a uh, free and democratic Kosovo, and uh, so it's also for us uh, a great pleasure to work with Kosovo on its further development uh, as we. Uh, work together. Thanks very much. Ishte ky Vim Gertz është raportuesi për drejtat e njeriut direkt të Ministri i Punëve të Jashtme të Holandës.